The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, good afternoon. This is Jack Manino. And today we're going to be talking about securing Kubernetes architectures. So today's topics, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what Kubernetes is. Kubernetes is being used uh, quite a bit across the industry at this point to scale and deploy containers. Uh, it provides quite a few security opportunities and we're gonna take a look at those today. And so we're gonna look at the Kubernetes control plane and core components that make up Kubernetes. We're gonna take a look at how pods and containers are deployed and secured uh, when running them on Kubernetes. Uh, we're gonna take a look at some authentication and authorization patterns. We're gonna look at how we distribute secrets to our services running on Kubernetes, and we're gonna look at some of the options we have from logging and monitoring. As for myself, I'm Jack Manino. I'm the CEO at Invisium. I've been working here since 2009, since we started the company. Uh, nowadays, I do most of my development in things like Scala and Go, and really passionate these days about uh, cloud-native security and, and figuring out uh, how do we make these things as secure as possible and leverage the opportunities in front of us uh, by some modern uh, systems that we have. So why does everybody care about Kubernetes? So Kubernetes is a great way to deploy and scale your containers. So most organizations aren't scaling their containers using a bunch of shell scripts. So Kubernetes provides the orchestration and management and scheduling capabilities to run your containers across either physical or virtual clusters. So basically what it allows you to do is run and scale your services and horizontally scale as far as you need to. So it's a really great compute model that takes advantage of cloud native architectures. So we have a lot of opportunities in front of us uh, to simplify things that have been pretty hard traditionally from security. It's things like ensuring stack and kernel protection mitigations are being enforced to uh, dictating what types of accounts uh, can run on those containers. Uh, we can centralize a lot of these things as opposed to leaving them up to developers uh, in distributed teams. Uh, so we can find a good balance between letting people move pretty quickly and seamlessly integrating security for a lot of things that have been pretty hard traditionally. Uh, but with that power means that things can also spin out of control pretty quickly. So we're able to spin up new services pretty fast. Uh, we're, allowed, we're able to use APIs to deploy services, to kill services, to update services. And so we really have to think about things like who can deploy and what types of operations can they do to our running clusters. So um, additionally, things that we need to think about early uh, regard, regarding network and, and, and host isolation tend to get a little bit harder when we try to bolt those things on later on after we've designed our architecture. And we'll take a little bit more of a look uh, at the architectural components of how we'd want to implement these policies. So our keys to security success, uh, we want to automate as much as possible and we want to make as many parts of security repeatable as we can. So as we'll see in Kubernetes, we're using primarily uh, YAML and JSON uh, to pretty much feed things into the API, which are stored uh, inside of etcd uh, and serialized in JSON format. So uh, we have the ability to use standard formats to define things like security policies and roles and things that we can tie to our services and uh, seamlessly um, manage. Uh, we do want to provide self-service. So we don't want to make it incredibly hard to deploy new services and ship new things. Uh, so we want to make sure that we provide our developers and engineering teams with just enough protections to make their jobs easier, but not to slow them down. And we also want to be able to look at things from multiple layers. So when we're dealing with things inside of Kubernetes, uh, we may have an application running inside of a container, uh, which could be part of a pod, and that could be part of different workloads. Uh, that can be exposed uh, with a service, with an ingress, 
so we have multiple layers that could be associated with a single primitive like a pod in a container. Uh, and we want to understand through labeling and tagging and annotations uh, what's happening in different layers as we move. So it is very important to understand um, how our code uh, propagates uh, as workloads across our cluster. So at a really, really high level, this is what a Kubernetes architecture looks like. So we're going to have an API server every single time. So the API server is essentially how our cluster does most operations. So uh, whether it's internal components, uh, such as the kubelet or our containers and service accounts, um, they generally leverage the API server uh, to do most cluster operations. So the API server maintains the cluster state. Uh, the API server is definitely where the attackers want to go if they want to uh, pretty much game over your architecture pretty quickly. So the API server, as we'll look at quite a bit more, uh, is a place you really want to look at hardening things down. Uh, so generally in each cluster, we're going to have at least one master. And the master is going to have things like etcd. Uh, the API server does run uh, within the master plane. And uh, we also have scheduler and controller. So scheduler dictates where resources are run. And we have controllers for a multitude of things, including uh, creating secrets, creating workloads, pod management, uh, so on and so forth. So Kubernetes uses controllers to do those things. Those controllers interact with the API server, and they interact with uh, various nodes. So when you run things on Kubernetes, the master pretty much handles scheduling and all of the cluster operations, and each node actually handles running your containers. So things that happen at the node level include injecting secrets into your containers, uh, ensuring that all of the different runtime emission policies are being enforced, and we'll take a look at how we can control those um, on a container by container basis. But generally, those things are handled uh, at the node level. Um, as well as proxying and different things like firewalling between our services running on the nodes. Uh, we do things like use IP, po uh, IP tables policies uh, to restrict uh, various pods on each node um, and across nodes from communicating with each other. So some terminology, the master is our cluster master where uh, a lot of decisions happen. We have the ability to isolate things into different namespaces. So for example, we can use a namespace for production. We can use a namespace for test. We can use a namespace for UAT. So we have the ability to do segmentation at that level, which gives you some protection uh, at the DNS level. It gives you uh, IP networking, as well as controls the propagation of different things like secrets, and allows you to set more fine-grained policies on a namespace by namespace basis, as opposed to granting uh, various entitlements at the cluster level. So when we look at role-based access control, um, we'll see why that's pretty important. Uh, we have many nodes that are going to spin up. So you can spin up one to uh, hundreds of thousands of nodes, depending on how far you need to scale things. Um, our pods are going to run more, one or more containers. So that ends up being. Um, essentially a wrapper for grouping our containers together. Uh, and that's going to let us do things like tie security policies to them, uh, as well as share resources and things within a pod, uh, including things like secrets um, and accounts and so forth. So when we create a pod, we generally get a service account, and those end up getting shared between containers within that pod as well. Um, so there are some security strategies we can also wrap around that as well um, at the pod level. And we'll have workloads that are going to essentially scale and run your containers. Uh, so you can have things like uh, daemon sets, you can have workloads, you can have replica sets. And depending on which workload type you're going to use, uh, it's just going to do different things behind the scenes in terms of how uh, it's going to make your service fail over uh, resistant and um, deployed across different nodes and different strategies. So depending on which workload you're going to specify, uh, is going to probably dictate how you want uh, your applications to run and survive uh, in the event of failures. So we talk about cloud native systems and Kubernetes essentially provides uh, the orchestration management layer uh, as well as uh, hooks to handle the runtime uh, of our containers. So generally when we have cloud native, uh, cloud -native systems, we assume one that they're running in containers, 
uh, and they're not being run in, say, you know, traditional virtual machines, which we typically scale um, vertically. And we have a distributed management and orchestration system. So there are other ones out there like Mesos and uh, ECS, uh, but Kubernetes obviously fills that uh, void here. And we're we typically are building microservices, right? So we're not building typically large monolithic applications. Uh, we tend to build small decoupled services uh, that are fairly minimalistic. Uh, but when we build microservices, we tend to build uh, things, for example, with like a service with its own data store as opposed to if we're building a monolith. Uh, so in terms of the programmatic patterns and the way we build uh, our systems, uh, we tend to kind of group our systems in contexts uh, along with those services, right? So in terms of uh, what kind of architecture we build, it's very service oriented on something like, like Kubernetes as opposed to building a big monolithic application uh, using something like Java struts. So microservices do have a bunch of different definitions. Uh, you can pick the one you like the most. Uh, I like this quote from Martin Fowler. Uh, basically just gives you kind of an overview in terms of what defines a microservice. Uh, but we do tend to kind of uh, organize and deploy those around business capabilities, um, around automation, uh, and teams, right? So we tend to structure um, our services kind of around the business capabilities, and everything kind of tends to fill in from there. Uh, but we also, in a microservice environment, tend to deal with uh, more of a polyglot programmatic environment where everybody kind of brings the best tool uh, to solve the problem as opposed to being kind of shackled into um, a java.net or another stack, right? So it's considerations uh, that we're dealing with a lot more stacks all the time. Uh, now, properties of microservices, uh, some things that Kubernetes kind of works peanut butter and jelly like with, uh, independently deployable services. So each service is essentially being deployed in a container uh, and, it can, and a pod can be in a collection of containers. So we fulfill that. Uh, we can decentralize things, uh, especially across namespaces. So uh, lots of times you'll have a namespace per application or per business function. Uh, so Kubernetes provides us with the ability to structure our development around that. And uh, resiliency to failures and contagion between services. So when we use different workload types, the goal uh, is that we're not setting up our services in a way that one kind of cascades and brings things down. Uh, and when we look at other technologies, uh, which may be outside of this scope of this, uh, like Envoy, uh, there's a lot of tools out there that are trying to solve problems uh, with regards to circuit breaking uh, and other challenges that we deal with um, in distributed systems. Um, so people are thinking pretty hard about that. Uh, smart endpoints and dumb pipes. So we tend to put a lot more logic um, back in our services, and uh, we tend to do a lot less um, routing and middleware. Now, Kubernetes does a lot of magical things behind the scenes like uh, service discovery uh, and other things that we'd have to think about um, in a service-oriented environment. Uh, so Kubernetes does kind of make it a lot easier for you to build really dumb services uh, that don't know a lot about the architecture but have everything they need to function, right? Uh, which allows us at that point to build very decoupled systems. And in terms of testing, uh, it was a lot easier when we built monolithic services, right? So uh, we maybe had one database backend, right? We had a single monolithic stack, so we could stand that up in the database. And uh, we kind of knew what was happening when we tested things. Uh, it was very synchronous, right? Uh, in you know a modern cloud native stack, uh, especially when we do things like message passing and work with technologies like Kafka and Kinesis and SNS, uh, with the goal of decoupling our services and having really loose couplings uh, and the ability to talk to each other without writing code um, presents a lot of, I guess, testability challenges um, in a distributed world. Uh, so things like unit and integration testing are really important, uh, especially as we start to do interesting things with the container runtimes, like injecting different security policies. Uh, we do want to make sure things like SE Linux aren't breaking our containers. Um, because security that breaks stuff isn't really useful, right? Um, your scanner probably is, you know, honestly going to have some issues uh, understanding and kind of ingesting some of these networks at this point. Uh, the good thing, though, is that these are all software defined, right? Uh, so whether you're using uh, Kubernetes and the network policy, whether you're using tools like Calico, um, Weave, 
Uh, they're common formats, and because we know how to parse common formats, uh, these things are arguably easier to hopefully tool around as kind of the, the, the industry matures a little bit and we kind of wrap our heads around these problems. Uh, but I, I definitely see uh, more opportunities as opposed to things being hard, but we, we still haven't uh, invested as much time and effort in tooling in this area as we probably have around traditional and, and legacy architectures. Uh, but distributed systems provide a lot of challenges. Um, things like chaos testing and chaos engineering uh, kind of try to look at some of these problems in terms of what can go wrong uh, and what can go wrong, but are, are our systems resilient enough um, to handle, you know, regions going down, um, authentication services not being there and other dependencies? Uh, do we actually fail over as expected? Um, does our CDN uh, work the way we expect it to, right? Um, lots of these things, right? And as we, we build distributed systems, uh, this kind of thinking, I think, becomes more and more important. Uh, even at the Kubernetes layer, right? It is kind of useful to understand um, if we have an outage, right? Uh, maybe we're doing, say, for example, um, a multi-cluster federated type of thing, or maybe we're doing some type of replication. Um, we do want to know, basically, if uh, we knock a couple nodes down in a certain region, um, what happens, right? Uh, do we have proper resiliency where those are replicated accordingly um, across enough nodes, right? Or did we mess that up? So. Uh, this kind of thinking is important um, just because you want to prevent uh, denial of service conditions and things like that as well. So day zero plans, obviously we want to think about are we running it on a, a cloud platform or are we uh, standing up a Kubernetes cluster um, on bare metal in our own data center or perhaps uh, maybe you're of the type that uh, runs your own cloud, right? Um, but there are considerations. So. Kubernetes, uh, as we're starting to see the trend, as we're starting to see things like AWS's EKS and Azure with AKS and GCP with GKE and uh, DigitalOcean has a service, Pivotal's in that game as well. And um, they end up doing some optimizations and security for you. Uh, so there are some things you may have to think about hardening out of the box uh, that maybe GCP might have solved for you, uh, especially things like uh, binding SED interfaces and things like that and internal um, cluster hardening uh, of the core components. Some of those things are handled for you. Um, some of those things may also vary across the board um, and you may have better or worse options um, for integrating with some of like the cloud uh, platform native services than you would um, in terms of doing it like, in, you know, injecting identity and stuff like that uh, into your containers. Um, are we okay with a flat architecture or we need to think really hard about segmentation and kind of hierarchy? Uh, basically, do we have a really small team uh, and we're not planning on having hundreds and dozens of services or um, are we a, a large financial institution that has to really think about um, access and stuff like that, right? So depending on uh, what kind of shop you are, your tolerance for risk, um, how important it is for you to be certain that certain services have no way to communicate with others or um, grab and access the data coming off of them, right? Uh, or if people in one group should ever have the ability to affect or impact services shipped by another team, uh, that really varies across the board depending on the team. Uh, and those are things you need to think about uh, when you're initially planning out how you're gonna build things. And also, do we have a good uh, handle on general container and application security, right? So. Container hygiene is pretty important since containers are essentially the unit of operation that we're using across the board. Uh, so we want to make sure that our containers are hardened in a way that if a service is compromised, uh, we're going to prevent uh, the ability for an attacker to move laterally and elevate privileges in the cluster. So an example is uh, maybe you have a web application that's vulnerable to SQL injection uh, somebody's able to elevate to root privs, right? Or maybe it's an RCE bug, uh, and they're able to basically get root on that container. You want to make sure that that is pretty much isolated, right? So you want to make sure that uh, now, which is a malicious container, right, inside of your environment, you want to make sure that it can't uh, impact the cluster, and you want to limit what it can do to other services, right? And so we'll take a look at a couple different ways that we can um, implement those types of things as well. Um, but application security. Uh, is kind of outside the scope of here, but it should be a no-brainer that if you're deploying services uh, to Kubernetes, then you want to make sure that you've done uh, security hygiene on those, right? 
So things we need to think about, do all your services need to communicate? Uh, do all your developers need rights to all services or only a subset? So do you need to grant them roles and rights to things um, at the cluster level or can you do it at say like a namespace level, right? And uh, who should get things like secrets, right? You really need to think about that um, for things like separation of duties, um, key management across services, right? So um, the trend now is that you're, it's going to get a lot easier with um, just kind of the, the, the cloud services shipping uh, managed Kubernetes services that uh, you'll be able to use their key services to manage, rotate, and, and, and all those things as opposed to um, hard code keys and, and make them hard to uh, rotate, make them hard to kind of keep out of people's hands. Um, but you need to think about those early on, right? Um, especially for things that are in compliance scope, uh, you know, key, key storage. Um, you obviously don't want to store, you know, asymmetric keys next to each other, right? Um, and you don't want to let people with one API call um, pull all that key material down um, to do whatever they want. So you really do need to think about those things um, before you open that can of worms. So let's take a little bit of a look at the control plane and core components. So the Kubernetes control plane is made up of a few different things. Uh, first and foremost, it's split between master and node. The master runs etcd, the API server scheduler, and the controller manager. So the API server as we looked at is how most cluster operations um, are performed. So we do different things, for example, like getting pods, updating pods, deleting pods. Uh, but essentially everything that we can think of um, is, is essentially exposed to some kind of API call, uh, including things like talking to containers. So we can also uh, directly run commands inside of containers um, by API call. So lots of really interesting things there. Etcd is where all of the basically cluster state is stored. So anything that API server does, it's stored with an etcd. Uh, and anything that basically different services want to know about the state of the cluster at any given time, they ask the API server, which talks to etcd. The scheduler is what essentially schedules resources throughout the cluster. So um, if there's five nodes and we need to basically spin up a few um, additional uh, resources within a workload, then the schedule is going to handle that and figure out where that's going to happen. Uh, the schedule is also what we can use to impact directly which nodes things run on. So we may run into scenarios where it may be favorable to run a container on a specific node that maybe is using specific or specified hardware, uh, things like GPUs or uh, other hardware security things that would be desirable for our systems to run on that. So uh, we can use different things, including taints and tolerations uh, that are going to be fed into the scheduler, uh, which allow us to specify the nodes that different things are going to run on. Uh, so scheduling is pretty powerful. The controller manager uh, is what's going to spin up different controllers within the, the cluster. So we have a controller manager for pretty much everything, uh, ranging from pods uh, to role-based access control. Um, so Coming out of my slides just for a second, um, uh, if we take a look uh, inside of the actual Kubernetes uh, source code itself, and um, we take a look down here at controllers, uh, we can see we have a controller for uh, a lot of different things, right? From bootstrapping, uh, certificate management, cron jobs, uh, daemons, deployments, um, you name it, right? Uh, and basically each one of these controllers has some custom logic in there uh, that's going to determine how those resources are managed um, throughout the cluster, right? So each one of those are run inside of controllers and the controller manager is what can essentially handle spinning those up. Uh, down at the node level, uh, the most important thing there is the kubelet. So the kubelet is uh, the primary interface uh, to the container runtime. So in this example here, we have Docker. Uh, in reality, that looks more like um, OCI interface that allows you to interface with different container runtimes. So Docker is the most popular one, and, and, and Docker uh, is what most people are still using nowadays. Uh, but you have the ability to use other container runtimes, things like Container D, uh, something newer, which is Gvisor. Uh, which, if anyone hasn't seen that, uh, they talked about it a bit at KubeCon this past week. Uh, 
uh, really, really awesome from a security perspective. Uh, but it gives you the ability to have flexibility with the container runtimes as well. And so basically the kubelets uh, is where that uh, is going to happen. So kubelet is going to basically do different things like starting a container, uh, stopping containers, um, and also talking back uh, to the master uh, and the API server to get information about the cluster state. Um, with regards to the kubelet, uh, kubelet is a pretty ripe attack surface for containers. Containers. So the, the, the scenario there is that you have a container that gets compromised. Uh, that container could potentially talk directly to the kubelet and invoke API commands uh, unauthenticated. So um, there's been some hardening in recent versions, but uh, that it's been pretty insecure uh, for quite some time. Uh, and different implementations do do different things to harden that. Uh, but there have been some kind of interesting attacks and uh, novel ways to kind of get at the kubelet from there. And if you can get at the kubelet as one application, and say you're like a, a, not, a low privileged application, uh, if you can basically control another uh, container from there, you essentially have arbitrary control over you know things inside of that cluster. So you do want to limit the ability for a container to elevate privileges uh, through the kubelet. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we kind of move along here. And the Kubernetes proxy, and last but not least there, the Kubernetes proxy is what is used to limit reachability uh, between services. Uh, so there's some firewalling using things like IP tables under the hood. Um, and that's essentially what happens. And essentially, the, the proxy is running uh, at the node level. Um, to do that type of thing, to do that type of thing uh, between pods. So, out of the gate, there's quite a few things that aren't hardened for you. Uh, took the liberty of making a few of them orange and highlighting them. Uh, plain text HP connections uh, between services. Um, the API server uh, isn't authenticated. Um, certificate validation is not uh, done by default. And so that kind of shows us that we have uh, some things to kind of harden out of the gate. So I will say that as each version of Kubernetes is released, uh, little by little, uh, some of the security low fruit, low hanging fruit continues to get fixed. So over time, I'd imagine it'll continue to get better, as well as the platform integrations that are hardening as well. Uh, but here's an example. Um, this is pulled out of using um, the Heptio AWS Quick Start Guide. So one thing they do is use Python's random uh, to create cube admin tokens. And those tokens are used uh, by nodes to authenticate to the cluster. So um, this isn't an ideal thing. And uh, obviously, it does require some, uh, it's not super trivial to attack. Uh, but it's one of those things to kind of consider that uh, as you're using different implementations, uh, you really want to do understand what it's doing underneath the hood that may deviate from what you need to be expecting or would want as a security best practice. So, um, you know, in this scenario, they could use uh, secure random type of generator, right, and make this a little, little bit better, but just kind of illustrates um, that there's probably no implementation that gets it uh, perfect. So let's talk a little bit about pods and containers uh, that we deploy. So some of the security hygiene stuff, uh, do you have vetted images? Uh, do we pull, for example, from uh, Alpine or Slim images? Or um, do we use the biggest image that has tons of post-exploitation tools on there for attackers to use if they compromise a single pod or container? Um, with regards to uh, versioning, we want to understand who can actually push things, uh, who can override certain security controls. Uh, we want to understand, um, are we allowing containers to be deployed that have known vulnerabilities? Meaning, if we have an application that we know uh, is hosting code that has um, uh, you know, a really, really outdated version of Postgres that uh, has a remote code execution type of vulnerability or, uh, or Apache Tomcat, right? Um, do we allow those to actually be promoted um, to, to run uh, in the cluster, right? So 
we want to have an ability to, to, to kind of block those things. Um, there's probably, that's probably more of a solved problem, I think, in some ways than, than some other things. Uh, there's a bunch of commercial tools. There's also uh, some open source attempts like Claire at doing that. Um, but that kind of solves the continuous approach, right? Um, but then we also need to think about things like emissions, right? Uh, do we want to write emission controllers um, to deny uh, those types of things, right? Has somebody else already written them? Um, are there commercial tools that do that? Uh, so on and so forth. There's a lot of different ways to kind of solve those problems. Um, and we want to think about things like uh, how does the orchestration or other layers above modify the attack surface or reduce the attack surface of the container? Uh, so we can use things like uh, SC Linux, we can use AppArmor, we can use SecComp, uh, we can even set uh, Linux capabilities at Kubernetes, uh, which could also kind of conflict what's being set at the Docker level. But nonetheless, um, we can use uh, that layer to at least ensure um, kind of a base level of what's being set in those containers. So we can handle some of those things at the container level, um, but there is some appeal to being able to do it in one shot. Um, at the orchestration layer. Uh, so here's an example of things, right? We, we don't want to see people doing. Uh, so we took the liberty there of um, using like a big image as opposed to something like an Alpine, right? So uh, larger attack surface, right? More poor exploitation tools, more packages to manage, um, you know, more things for an attacker to jump to. Uh, and we also have like, you know, vulnerable shell shock. So couple different things that we could have kind of caught there, right? Did did we have a container that we, you know, uh, a base image that we allow um, into the cluster? Did we have um, the absence of, you know, critical vulnerabilities? And the answer is like no to both of those. Um, so, you know, there's more commercial tooling popping up that, that addresses some of these things. Um, you can also write your own emission controllers to do just about anything. Uh, so you could write a, a really simple emission controller to check for some of these things. Um, before allowing pods um, to be admitted, right? Um, you can also use things like Brigade uh, to do things like triggers on builds um, to determine some of those things. But yeah, mission control is a cool way to do that. So one of the things that you have the ability to do um, is set pod security policies. So pod security policies allow you to um, enforce essentially security defaults for things. So um, we can basically say anything and be admitted, admitted to the cluster um, is either going to set some of these things or it's going to adhere to some of these things or not be able to basically emit it, right? So uh, we have some assurance that if something's running uh, with that emission controller and pod security policy um, being enforced, uh, that we have some common behavior across the board. So this, this is a good opportunity in my opinion. So here's an example of a couple different things there. Uh, so we can set policies uh, in a couple different ways. We can set a pod security policy, which is on the right. Uh, so the pod security policy is what we use with emissions. And we can set things, for example, like uh, allowing a container to be privileged, um, allowing it to escalate and, 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 and get privileges. We can do things like, say, uh, require which um, Linux capabilities are dropped. Um, and so basically that limits what root can do. Now that may be hard to drop all capabilities, um, but we can, for example, say containers can only access certain volumes uh, down by host network, host IP and host uh, PID. We can limit what that container can actually access with regards to underlying um, host resources, which limits the ability for um, a malicious or a compromised container um, to impact the rest of the cluster. Now, if you combine stuff like that with strict egress um, from uh, using the network policy uh, to basically limit which containers can essentially, you know, do egress calls, um, you can make it fairly hard to, uh, you know, make it, you know, move around uh, via network IO, right? Um, you can also limit, for example, where root can run um, just by a couple different things. Um, through you know limiting privileges as well as you know not running root group uh, by using under something like supplemental groups uh, on the right um, a minute and a max um, of one to sixty five five three five where um, we ignore root which is zero um, additionally uh, we could whitelist all the volumes uh, so I have two there just to kind of illustrate that 
but if we want to be more granular, um, we can specify specific volumes. Uh, and we could also basically make it a little bit harder to write um, to file systems. Uh, on the left hand side, we have um, a security context uh, and a pod security context at that. Um, so we have the ability to set um, policies as well um, at the pod level as well as at the container level. So we can have a pod security context or a security context. If we set the pod level, then it's applicable to all of the containers within that pod. Um, so it gives us ability to set a couple things and then have it propagate down to all the containers in the pod. Um, if we have some of those things set at both the pod security context and the security context level, the one that's set at the security context level would take precedence um, over what's set at the pod level, just in case you're curious how that works. Um, I had to dig around a little bit for that myself. So with regards to things like SecComp, uh, so SecComp allows you to disallow uh, or explicitly allow certain syscalls. Um, so by default, uh, this is what the Docker um, default SecComp policy uh, prevents. Um, and this is quite a bit, right? So it's probably not everything in the world that um, you would use to, 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 to do things and abuse root privileges. Um, but it does take away a significant part of the attack surface. Um, so I often say that I think it's unfair of us to think that our engineering teams uh, should become experts at things like uh, SecComp and AppArmor and uh, SE Linux. Um, to be honest, like SE Linux still confuses me. Uh, and it's probably a lot harder for you know some of our engineers um, that just write code to kind of get into uh, understanding how the kernel works. So um, my particular take is that uh, that using things like the default SecComp and AppArmor uh, policies, um, they're an easy, quick win. That if we can set those things um, and enforce those things, then we get a lot of protection just kind of by doing nothing. Um, and I think that's pretty huge, right? Um, because in the age of automation and moving fast, uh, that's just one less thing we need to think about, um, or maybe not think about quite as hard. Uh, with regards to doing things like restricting root capabilities, um, so by default, uh, Linux has quite a few capabilities and things we can do. Um, Docker uh, allows a handful of those. Um, so here's an example of what Docker gives you. Um, and if you look at, for example, um, OCI containers, they, they, they kind of drill that down even further and you start from an even smaller list of capabilities potentially. Uh, so this is pretty important, right? Because uh, if you can restrict uh, what capabilities um, root can run as, uh, so even if basically uh, a you know, an application is able to elevate itself to root, um, you can also limit what those, those, those root capabilities can do. Um, which essentially can further limit um, that attacker, right? Uh, so pretty powerful, um, kind of crazy not to take advantage. Uh, you do kind of see in the real world that people, in my experience, um, overprivilege their containers. Uh, a lot of times you don't need to run a container as root, um, or if you do need to run it as root, you only need to run it as root for a fairly short amount of time, right? Uh, so think about, for example, a network service that may want to bind at a port uh, below 1024, but then once it's binded to that port below 1024, um, it may not need that again until potentially it maybe has to respawn that service, right? Um, so things like that to think about. Additionally, uh, you may end up dealing in some scenarios uh, with different uh, formats, right? So um, you may not just be parsing YAML. Uh, so everybody thinks uh, Kubernetes is YAML only. Um, in reality, the internal representation is uh, JSON and uh, protobufs. Um, but externally, uh, you can essentially use things like Helm and charts. Uh, so Helm is Kubernetes package manager. It allows you to uh, really easily package up your containers um, into applications, uh, create things pretty easily like the service, um, the associated workloads, ingress controllers, um, and have easily reprodu reproducible ways um, to deploy your applications, right? So you can do things like uh, set default settings, um, but the thing you get there is that uh, the appeal is that you can actually harden these services in one place um, and have some assurance that when you uh, are actually running it, um, there's really not a lot of deviation or drift from what's expected. So um, the trade-off is that, you know, you're going to have to potentially uh, 
if there's not a commercial tool, well, then you're probably going to have to write your own parsers for things, uh, so on and so forth. So um, Helm and Charts uh, use a combination of YAML and Go templates. Uh, so if you could parse a, a Go template and pull in variables, then you can uh, essentially work with Helm and Charts and, and analyze those on the fly. So let's talk a little bit about authentication and authorization within our clusters. So the Kubernetes API is critically important to authentic or to, to harden. Uh, so things like anonymous access um, gives you super duper privileged abilities to deploy, modify, and kill your services um, via API calls, and additionally, do things like remotely execute code. Um, if you're running uh, from an adequately privileged uh, container. So we have subjects within Kubernetes. So subjects are what we essentially use to authenticate um, users and services uh, for different operations. So we give users accounts to do API things um, that a user would do, right? So they'd want to um, manage uh, potentially secrets. They'd want to um, deploy a new service, uh, things like that. Um, whereas a service account is used by the pod, uh, and that may be more interested um, in, in, in kind of pod level operations and things it needs to know um, with regards to, to running the pod, killing the pod, um, and, and, and reconciling the state of it. Uh, so that's essentially going to be used um, by various services. Um, and each service account um, essentially is going to inject a token uh, into that pod, uh, which we'll take a look at in a minute. And we can also group those into services. Uh, we have resources, so you know the expected things within API groups. And then we have things that are non-resource uh, and API back, so things like health, uh, Z and stuff like that, uh, and Swagger are non-resourced um, objects. Initial API hardening, uh, so you want to disable like anonymous access and enable RBAC right off the bat. Um, you can enable authentication. Uh, you want to avoid uh, kind of the plain text routes like basic auth, um, which is popular unfortunately. Um, and uh, there's not really a great way to rotate uh, credentials, uh, revoke them, um, so on and so forth. So. Uh, really not a huge fan of using basic auth if you don't have to. So there's a bunch of different uh, authenticator types and you can use more than one. Um, so you can use passwords, um, you can use tokens, you can use JWT. Uh, client certificates with X509 is definitely a way to go. Um, newer is external credential providers, which I'd imagine as you start to see more managed Kubernetes services, uh, Internal credential providers probably becomes a de facto way of doing things. Uh, so you'd be crazy not to want to hook into something like uh, Cognito uh, or you know pick another identity provider, um, so on and so forth. Uh, you're able to also use OpenO, OpenID, OpenO, uh, OAuth, and some other traditional routes as well. Uh, but things to think about, for example, like basic auth creds, right? Uh, they don't go away. Tokens don't. Uh, ever expire and so basically if you want tokens to expire then um, that's basically going to entail um, a cost to restart uh, to do that uh, unless something changed in the most recent releases uh, that i'm not aware of with regards to service accounts uh, service accounts can be pretty dangerous um, if we don't think about how to limit what we share between them so anytime you create a new pod um, if you don't specify a service account, then what it does is it'll use like the default service account. Um, but that default service account uh, is going to be um, namespaced granted, um, but that is going to be shared um, across potentially multiple services, which means that if you have one uh, application uh, that gets compromised uh, and that application is able to basically dump out that service token, which is essentially just the JWT, uh, and then that basically can do essentially uh, anything and impersonate those other services as well um, within the namespace, right? So depending on what you've granted to that account um, can, can make it pretty dangerous uh, as well as what, you know, potentially you're sharing, right? So 
by design, you want to think pretty early on about uh, if you're creating a new uh, pod, you want to make sure that you're doing it under um, a fresh service account each time um, and not falling into the trap of using default service accounts. Um, because as you can see there, um, when we create that, there's not uh, any um, expires um, buy or anything like that uh, set on that JWT token. Uh, things that you could use to, to, to manage the life cycle of JWT aren't being used here. Uh, additionally, another thing that we want to do is also set use service account lookup equals true um, on the API server. Uh, so what the API server does is it'll check uh, the validity of the token. So we're signing the JWT. So it's concerned with basically making sure that we're giving it a valid JWT, uh, which has claims about what that who that service account is and, and what it's entitled to do. Um, and so basically uh, what can happen there is so imagine uh, we had, you know, maybe a, a rogue service account or something like that. And so maybe we, we killed that account off, um, but it maybe still has a valid token, right? Uh, so we want to make sure we set that. Basically what that's going to do is every time we have um, a token come in, uh, it's going to check the validity of token, but it's also going to make sure that the service account um, still exists within the cluster. So that's just kind of a secondary check um, to make sure that uh, in the event of a, a compromise, right, we're not uh, given basically like a persistent route to continue attacking us. So creating service accounts, um, pretty straightforward, right? We create the service account um, and then we create a pod and we make sure that we um, actually use that as a service account's name. Uh, and basically when we actually use an explicit service account, uh, it gets off of using the default at that point. So. Uh, assuming we've done that for each pod, uh, we can at least know that each pod is running um, as its own service account. So uh, that does kind of show that if we are um, putting things inside of a single pod, then they are sharing accounts potentially. Um, so things to think about as we couple services uh, inside of a pod as opposed to running um, small pods with like maybe one container versus a, a collection of containers, right? Uh, we do have to think about how we're sharing that service account um, between containers in that cluster, um, at least in uh, previous versions, right? Um, not kind of looking at the future. Uh, we can also work with things like um, HTO and Envoy. Uh, so we deal with this scenario um, in this scenario where uh, we want to uh, limit what a compromised pod can do uh, with regards to the cluster. Um, but things that that can solve, for example, um, are going to be, you know, service to service um, attacks, right? So imagine uh, we SQL inject something or we get, you know, remote code execution. Um, and now we just basically want to start scanning, you know, say the uh, internal network. Um, and we want to find, you know, maybe something vulnerable to uh, something we have a canned attack for, right? Um, so we could potentially limit that. Um, in some ways, but if we have a trusted service, the trusted service, that's a little bit harder. Um, we do have the ability to limit what, like say, rogue containers can do. Um, and we can use like mutual TLS. Uh, so things like Istio, Envoy, um, and specifically like Istio Auth, uh, make this a really neat pattern where we can use something like Envoy um, as a sidecar that handles um, things like mutual TLS between services. Um, authentication, uh, service encryption, uh, some identity and um, uh, entitlements to resources for us. Um, I think this is a better pattern, in my opinion, than um, building these things into your apps. Uh, so this kind of follows along with the kind of, uh, you know, dumb, um, uh, dumb endpoint smart pipes kind of thing. Um, where uh, we're not dealing with these uh, kind of complexities inside of our service. Uh, but this is another scenario we can kind of, um, we can harden that as well, um, just by architectural uh, tools and design. With regards to role-based access control, so Kubernetes makes it pretty appealing to use role-based access control. Uh, so, Earlier versions of Kubernetes didn't have it available, so um, you didn't have the ability to limit what uh, various subjects could do inside of your cluster, uh, which, as you imagine, is, is, is really, really dangerous. So 
um, Kubernetes uh, team decided that we need role-based access controls and uh, attribute-based, which we're not going to talk as much about attribute-based access control today. Uh, but essentially what uh, role-based access control allows us to do um, is limit what a uh, specific subject can do in the cluster. Uh, and we have the ability to do that um, at both the namespace level as well as um, the cluster level. Excuse me. So if we grant things at the cluster level, the thing we have to consider is that uh, that's going to apply to all namespaces. So that's pretty much giving super user rights, essentially, in some ways um, to a user across. So we really want to be careful about things we grant at the cluster level. Um, more appealing in most cases, um, and you should talk yourself out, figure out if you have a reason to talk yourself out of it before you ever use cluster role bindings, um, is using role bindings at the namespace level. Uh, more often than not, that's where you want to be dealing with things. So if you provide uh, roles and entitlements at the namespace level to people or um, service accounts, uh, that's going to limit what they can do in other namespaces through the API. Because keep in mind, the API um, understands and talks to and traverses all namespaces, right? Uh, so you want to limit the ability to attack and abuse other namespaces uh, through the API. So here's an example um, of creating a role and then binding the role uh, to a namespace. So on the left-hand side, uh, we're just basically uh, using a namespace, which we don't want to use default, uh, but we did here. And uh, what we're doing is we're, one, specifying the API groups. Um, Kubernetes has different API groups, uh, things like core, things like apps, things like role-based access control, um, things like audit, authorization. So there's a handful of API groups. And within those API groups, they have different resources. So what you have to do there is specify the API group. So in the, in the order uh, that it works, first it says which API groups are there. And then within those API groups, it looks to see which resources you've explicitly allowed in those API groups, right? So if you have pods, pods are part of um, the legacy and core group, which is uh, what you see there, which is a blank string. Um, so basically by putting pods there, um, you have the ability to, to essentially at that point get, watch, and list pods, um, but you wouldn't be able to pull things like secrets um, or, you know, for example, different workloads. Um, you'd be fairly limited to pods at that point, right? Um, and then verbs. So at the API level, you're allowed to do different things through different verbs. Uh, so for anyone that's familiar with REST, uh, it obeys the same thing. So if you want to do a read, that's a get. Uh, if you want to do um, a create, right, that's a post. Um, if you want to do um, an update, right, um, so on and so forth. The uh, different thing there, I guess, that you wouldn't see elsewhere is the watch. Um, so etcd, which is used the key value store, supports um, setting watches on different resources. So if anything changes within a, spec a specific resource, um, consumers can get updates to those. So that's a verb in terms of the, 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 the Kubernetes API that wouldn't be typically associated with HTTP. Uh, but basically when you have it set up like that, so now um, we're saying that inside of that specific namespace, um, this specific role is able to do uh, pods. It's able to do uh, get, watch, and list on pods. Um, so if you would basically try to do um, any of those operations for something uh, not related to pods, um, you'd basically get authorization failures at that point. Um, in terms of binding it on the right-hand side, this is how we make it real. So one, we have to set uh, whatever namespace we want to use. Um, we want to, one, set the subjects. So here, just use a single account, um, which is a user. Uh, now, we could have used the subject um, of a, a service account, or we could have also used groups. And we want to... Uh, tie it to the actual role and reference that. So the role is role pods read, which inherits that role. So now when we set that, what we've done is given the user only the ability to read pods in a specific namespace. So if that user would try to do uh, read pod on a namespace they don't own, or they would try to read pods like at a global level without a namespace, um, meaning they want to do it across like a cluster, right? They they have um, issues doing that. Uh, they wouldn't be authorized to do that. So um, really powerful. 
Uh, and as you'd imagine, as um, you have different development teams, uh, maybe that's, you know, some people in DevOps, uh, your security team, uh, your tools, right? Because you're going to have different automated tools that you're going to want to give uh, different uh, API capabilities, right? So you, you really do need to think about things or things early on um, and go with that kind of least privilege uh, model as you go, right? You don't want to start from give everybody a uh, cluster admin um, and then start from there, right? You want to say basically no one gets anything and then we're going to give you exactly what you need uh, at the lowest level possible, right? So that covers some of the things we think about in Kubernetes with regards to authentication and with regards to uh, access control uh, for various cluster resources. So now let's take a look uh, and wrap up with uh, secrets management. So we need a secure way to share uh, our credentials and keys. So um, the best way to do it is not to hard code that into our containers. Uh, the best way to do that is to leverage the secrets management APIs. Uh, so we want to make it easy to do things like rotate and uh, more importantly, not hard code things and put them in our source code repositories on developer desktops. Um, the things we've been doing traditionally, we have the opportunity uh, to do right now and we should take advantage of these. So here's an example in Kubernetes of how we can create a new secret. Uh, so we can either create that secret uh, from YAML, we can create that secret from a file, we can create that secret uh, from just basically uh, command line itself. Um, so we have a couple different ways to feed that um, data in there. Uh, additionally now though, with uh, the better managed service options, uh, this is gonna get a lot easier to just use basically Azure, um, AWS, uh, GCPs, um, basically secrets, um, key management loading capabilities uh, to seamlessly manage these things for you. So um, hopefully in a year, we don't have to think about these things. In two years, we laugh uh, because we've gotten some time back in our lives. Uh, but in terms of secrets, uh, they're secret up until a certain point. Uh, so by default, everything is plain text inside of etcd. Uh, so here's an example um, through the Kubernetes API um, of just being able to decrypt things. And so as we can see, we can get that secret with no problem if we have um, the appropriate rights um, to read secrets. Uh, prior to Kubernetes 1.7, there was no ability to do any plain text encryption, um, which is not great, um, which basically means that if you get onto that master um, and that etcd server, it's, it's pretty much game over uh, because you've got all those secrets and um, you can do a lot of things with those services, decrypt data, depending on what's stored there. Um, 1.7 and above, you do have the ability to encrypt things um, at rest. Um, and you can do that at the API server um, by enabling like the experimental encryption provider config flag. Um, but the one thing there is that that's stored um, in plain text uh, on that uh, server. Uh, so you do wanna make sure that um, you, you maybe get rid of that uh, plain text key, uh, which is just base 64 um, from your local system. Uh, not perfect, um, but at the very least, um, you can get uh, some level of encryption. And we can also use role-based access control there um, in addition uh, to basically limit who can actually get uh, secrets and things like that. So in this example, um, we're using a group and um, we're just giving them the ability there to get secrets um, and nothing else, right? They can't do anything else but get the secrets. So, so <clears throat> talk for a minute about logging and monitoring uh, and what you're able to do there and then uh, we can turn it over for questions. Uh, so things that are in the OS top 10 2017, so uh, A10 is insufficient logging and monitoring. So uh, it is really important uh, to understand uh, in the event of an attack or uh, suspicious activity, we want to be able to see things uh, pretty quickly. Um, so now that we also have an additional layer of abstraction um, at the orchestration and management layer, uh, or actually several layers of abstraction, um, it gets even more important to kind of understand what's happening um, as, you know, different uh, attacks uh, or threats um, traverse multiple layers. So from uh, kind of a logging and monitoring infrastructure perspective, uh, we want to think about, you know, traditional things at the application level, right? So that's um, the explicit logs that we have. Um, that's things like 
uh, WAFs and RASP and anything else we're using um, to get some kind of runtime visibility into what's happening, right? Um, that could also be, you know, web uh, server logs, uh, anything else we can kind of glean. Uh, we can get a lot through container level logging. So things we're looking at there, for example, like uh, SecComp, uh, looking at uh, SE Linux policy um, violations, those things will be logged into the containers for you. Uh, so you do want to take advantage of the logs that you get there. Uh, with regards to things at the orchestration level, so uh, things we want to think about in terms of, uh, you know, if somebody were to deploy a malicious container, right, we'd want to maybe be able to recreate um, and understand those deployments. Um, if somebody made changes to RBAC, we'd want to be able to recreate those things and understand what happened and when. Um, if we have uh, a ton of failed logins to the API server, um, we want to see those things as well, right? So if somebody's internal and perhaps you're using basic auth and uh, you have someone that's just trying to brute force the API server for basic auth credentials, um, perhaps that is, that's an event that you'd want to uh, pull out of Kubernetes um, and you know either feed into your SIM or whatever you use to, to look at those events. Um, and you also have the cloud and infrastructure level. So as we're building cloud native systems, uh, we'd be crazy not to take advantage of things that um, our, our platforms offer. Um, around change management, um, around uh, logs and analytics, um, around various services, uh, modeling some of those relationships, uh, and alerting on anomalies. For example, we notice this service talk to this service, but that never happens. Um, you can get a lot of visibility um, through those systems, um, as well as other things uh, that are being built on top of the tools like Envoy. Um, to be able to use and, and leverage uh, the capabilities of things like distributed tracing um, and setting markers um, for security purposes. Uh, pretty cool. Here's an example in Kubernetes. Uh, so if you want to be able to use things like advanced auditing, um, you set true for that. And building an audit policy, you have uh, the ability to get um, information at different levels. levels. Uh, metadata, you get only the basics. Um, you can get full request and response, and you can get a decent amount of information um, about different requests and API um, attempts. Uh, so if you want a lot of data, um, you can get request response data for um, all those calls if you want to do um, forensics on that. Uh, it just depends on how much uh, fluff you want to ingest. You can also send things to webhook endpoints. So uh, if you have webhooks set up to do um, reporting and alerting, um, you can shove all that information out to a webhook endpoint. Um, and you can set this at the API server um, with authorization webhook config file setting, and then send that to your webhook of choice. So in conclusion, uh, hopefully I've shown you today that thinking about security early and anticipating future growth uh, is really important. Um, focus on the logical and organizational structure and codify it. Uh, those kind of uh, st structures, I think, kind of build themselves. Uh, but you really want to do think about those access patterns uh, and avoid uh, current and future mistakes uh, as your architecture evolves. You don't want to sold people down, but hopefully I've shown you today that there's enough ways to put enough security controls in place to uh, get rid of kind of the lowest hanging fruit and focus on uh, the more complex things and uh, hopefully avoiding security issues to begin with. And um, applying security controls at the layers that make the most sense. Um, we really do have to think about which layer of abstraction makes the most sense and where we can fix the most things at once as opposed to play whack-a-mole um, like we've traditionally done in security since the beginning of time. So if you have more questions about cloud native security and Kubernetes, uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, happy to take some of these conversations offline afterwards as well. Um, you can find us at these different places. Um, you can find us email, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So thank you everyone. And I'm gonna answer one question here. With Kubernetes, what's the recommended way to inject secrets into containers? So the recommended way to inject secrets into containers is to use the Kubernetes Secrets Management API. Um, so going back a uh, bunch of slides here, uh, just to show examples of creating secrets. Um, you want to create secrets this way. You don't want to do it with Docker run. Um, and you don't want to do it with uh, Kubernetes also uh, allows you to use config maps. 
Um, you can use config maps for just standard configuration stuff, but you really do want to avoid um, using config map um, for things like, you know, sensitive secrets, like, you know, encryption, decryption keys, uh, database passwords, and so on and so forth. So uh, hopefully that answers the question, but the secrets management API is the preferred way to do it. Now, with regards to how you manage things that you feed in, um, there's, you know, integrations with tools like Vault. Um, as we're getting more Kubernetes managed services, um, kind of seeing the trend move to that's probably how you want to uh, consider thinking about feeding your secrets into Kubernetes um, at runtime. So thank you everybody today for joining. And if you want the slides uh, and the presentation, we'll be following up the email with those as well.